Ever curious about what went down with the shadiest restaurant owners from Kitchen Nightmares? Well, you won't believe the chaos that followed. I could talk forever about why Peter's in Babylon is the absolute worst restaurant on Kitchen Nightmares. The guy running it had serious anger issues and acted like he was some sort of godfather. You sound like you're out the fucking godfather. So this little rescue mission was doomed from the start. I mean, what are the odds of Chef Ramsay with his British flair trying to save an Italian restaurant in America? Yeah, quite the mix, huh? Whoa, you dirty pig. What do we need, a death in the restaurant before some fucker gets the grip? Now, even though the restaurant was named after Peter, the spoiled brat, it was originally owned by his sister, Tina Pellegrino. While Tina tried her best to keep things running, Peter ran it into the ground with his hot-headed temperament. It's emotional. <laughs> So, what happened after the episode aired? Well, buckle up, because this story has a crazy twist. I'm the owner of this restaurant, Peter's. There's a lot of stress. This place is a fucking mess. I'm all over the place. But one thing's for sure, with the two feuding siblings at the helm of the sinking ship, Chef Ramsay had his work cut out for him. I believe Peter is a core problem of the restaurant. You see, Tina was pretty stressed out by the slow business. And to make things worse, the fact that most people thought Peter was the boss irritated her even more. You could tell that Tina was absolutely heartbroken and down. Tina was at her wit's end because she put in the most effort, but somehow Peter got all the credit. Well, she wouldn't have minded if Peter took over as the host, but the guy just didn't have the passion like Tina did. Meanwhile, Peter was always acting like some big mob boss, going off on the staff and customers alike. It takes so much pride in myself, my appearance, my car, my clothes. You see, Peter had these intense bursts of anger where he'd get fired up over nothing. I don't really know who Peter thinks he is. Honestly, I think he's hoping for a shot at the next Goodfellas movie. Peter was all about his looks. He's the host, but the kitchen was a disaster. I'm passionate. I'm Italian. I yell. Gentlemen, why is this guy here? While three ovens were down and a boiler was about to blow up, all Peter cared about was buying a new suit or showing off his Rolex instead of fixing the kitchen equipment. And then there was Tina, dealing with all of this chaos by herself as the debts kept piling up. Family's throwing everything on Tina's shoulders and I don't think she can handle it. The guy was so full of himself that he didn't care about anyone but himself. And while everything was falling apart, Yogi, their father, believed the family was super close. Ah, uh, talk about being in denial. He just didn't want to accept the reality. Anyway, after exhausting all her options, Tina decided to call in the big guns. Where is he? Come on. But get this, before Chef Ramsay even set foot in the restaurant, Peter, who was supposed to pick him up, was MIA. It's like Superman arrived. You know, so I'm very excited. Come on in. I feel like I'm in Hollywood. An hour later, Peter finally showed up in a swanky Mercedes like it was no big deal. I mean, come on. At least have the decency to be on time, right? And considering he was called in to save the family from bankruptcy, this sight came as a shock to Chef Ramsay. This is my family, mom, dad, this is Gordon Ramsay, and this is Tina. Peter obviously wanted to impress Chef Ramsay because, well, he only cared about his image, remember? So where did all the profit, if there was any, go? Right here? I believe Peter is a core problem of the restaurant. But Chef Ramsay wasn't impressed. Truth be told, he actually grew worried. Peter? How you doing, Gordon? Good to see you. Nice car. When they got to the restaurant, Chef Ramsay immediately sensed trouble. Well, this one's gonna be interesting, isn't it? Fuck me. Throughout, Chef Ramsay noticed Peter's high-handed behavior. It was clear Peter, unlike the rest of his family, wasn't attached to the business. Things were so obvious that the sous chef, John, even made fun of Peter's actions. Over. What's going on? John the sous chef is insulted over the parsley. Yeah, this dude was definitely in the wrong place. He knew nothing about duty and accountability. No wonder Chef Robert was worried about Tina, who was single-handedly carrying the entire restaurant. Chef Robert. Robert. Robert, Gordon Ramsay. How are you? This is, Robert. This is Robert O'Sara. The business had taken a huge hit, but Tina didn't want to give up. Despite that, she was starting to consider selling the place, which was wearing her down. She believed Peter's problems and his over-the-top narcissism were the main reasons for the restaurant's downfall. Most of the staff agreed with her. I believe Peter is a core problem of the restaurants. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for the disaster unfolding in the restaurant. Chef Ramsay realized the pressure of running the business had scarred every relationship. He gave them some time to cool off and returned the next day to an even crazier sight. When Chef Ramsay took a kitchen tour, he faced a disaster. Fuck it. The bread was rock hard, and the veggies in the fridge had seen better days. I'm cold, so stuff's rotten. Chef Ramsay ordered a deep clean, and Chef Robert shared his woes about the malfunctioning equipment. From the oven to the stoves to the hob, it was crazy how the chefs kept the kitchen running. To add to the mess, the fridge was leaking water. Things leaking here. 
However, Peter couldn't be bothered. Instead of taking charge, he blamed Robert, saying it was the head chef's job to maintain the kitchen. Yeah, he was trying to assert his position as the boss, but Chef Ramsay saw right through Peter's act and called him out. Chef Ramsay decided it was time for Peter to own up to his mistakes, so he put him on cleaning duty. Sure, the kitchen staff should maintain hygiene, but that doesn't mean the owners can ignore it. It's funny how Peter complained about the business while flaunting his expensive watch and shiny new teeth. Meanwhile, in the chaotic kitchen, they were struggling with a broken oven. Chef Robert poured his heart out to Chef Ramsay, blaming Peter for all of it. It's been such a long time since I have good equipment here. It's bothering me, but there's nothing I can do about it. Peter had no shame and was probably the most stuck-up, narcissistic person you could find. The only thing that's fake is my teeth. They're fucking white. They're white. They're bleach. How much does that cost? Despite having no reservations, the restaurant was packed because Chef Ramsay was in town. Chef Ramsay wanted to see if Peter could handle the dinner rush, so he put him to the test. No wonder the orders were taking forever and the waiters were getting stressed out. Ready? That's when they're gonna come out. He's an excellent chef. But he's crazy. Take them, take this out. Robert was trying his best to keep things together, yelling and hustling, while Peter seemed more interested in buying fancy bottles for his favorite customers. Peter thought that's how you woo customers, but Chef Ramsay wasn't buying it. Peter was clueless and foolish, giving away free food and drinks, which was just throwing away their slim profit margins. To make matters worse, Peter revealed that his doctor was a regular customer who got hefty meals for free. Meanwhile, Peter was walking around like a king, socializing with customers while the kitchen was a mess. Pick your fucking hands up, John. Guy. Pick your fucking hands up. You wanna hit me? You're the tough guy. You wanna hit me? Things got even worse when a bill collector showed up in the middle of service. Peter didn't handle it well, escalating the situation to a full-blown brawl in the streets. Chef Ramsay watched as Peter lost it when his dad Yogi got knocked to the floor. That was the last straw for Peter, who unleashed all his anger. Peter turned out to be a huge embarrassment to his family and everyone at the restaurant. Peter walked out mid-service, yelling and screaming in front of all the guests. The customers and staff witnessed a truly awful display of threats and cussing, but that wasn't all. Tina later told Chef Ramsay that Peter was dipping into the cash register whenever he felt like it. Yeah, he was stealing from his own restaurant. How much lower can you get? Just as things seemed to settle, a new collector showed up, and things got physical. Peter knocked the guy down, and it took John, Robert, and Yogi to restrain him while he continued to beat him up. And then Peter then rushed out and threw punches at the debt collector, leaving Chef Ramsay stunned by the outburst. One thing that can separate this restaurant from the others is running this. Peter had no problem threatening the bill collector. When things calmed down, Chef Ramsay tried to refocus on the relaunch, but remained wary of Peter's behavior. While everyone worked, Peter just hung out at the bar ordering drinks. Just to eat them. Oh, man. Oh, man. Peter. Things got worse when Peter blamed Nicole, a waitress, for the slow service. She ended up crying, and Peter just lost it again. With stuff out, she looked like she was having some sort of uh, meltdown. I don't make the drinks, I don't make the food. Peter's huge ego kept messing up the business, but Chef Ramsay decided to put a stop to it. I think this place will run better without you. Ouch, getting kicked out of a place named after you. But Chef Ramsay had a plan. And go home. Come back tomorrow morning. He told Peter to come back with better ideas, and surprisingly, Peter listened. The next day, he fixed leaks and got things right. His family-style food was a hit, bringing in customers and cash. The good of the business, and in the end, this place is me. This place is me. This is me. Peter threw a big family festival, even getting Chef Ramsay to enjoy it. He also got a priest to bless the restaurant. Who knew he had a holy side? But after the show, things went downhill fast. The restaurant closed in 2008, and despite Peter's efforts, the place's reputation didn't improve. Maybe his shady dealings with bill collectors had something to do with it. Peter had a secret life as Peter Pasta, a mob broker. He made serious cash, but none of it went into the restaurant. He ended up fighting with his brother-in-law, got a restraining order, and was kicked out of the mob. Total drama! Uh, Peter's dad, Yogi, had warned him to stay away from the mafia, and it looks like he should have listened. Yogi passed away before all this mess, probably thinking his family was close-knit. But with all that stress, it's no surprise things went south for Peter. So what's he doing now? Turns out he's out of a job and probably feeling like he's been hit by a truck. But that was ages ago, so Peter must have moved on by now. Apparently, someone spotted him looking fit and fab in Middle Village, Queens. Quite the turnaround from his tragic downfall. But hey, some probably had it even worse. Just like these restaurant owners right here. 
So, besides their infamous appearance on Dr. Phil, Sammy and Amy from Amy's Baking Company ended up on some shady federal lists. Chef Ramsay didn't just walk out on them for no reason, this couple was truly out of control. And what happened after the show? Even crazier. When the episode aired during season 6, viewers were stunned when Chef Ramsay said this. I have decided to do something I've never done before. It's such a shame. After rescuing countless failing restaurants, Chef Ramsay actually walked out for the first time ever. The situation was so bad that despite his usual passion for helping, he couldn't deal with the basics. These owners couldn't even get right. I mean, what else can you do when every attempt to help the couple gets shut down like this? You verbally insulted me yesterday, and I held my I tongue out truth. of class. I didn't tell you the truth. I didn't Why say nasty things. Back in Israel, Sammy had a shady criminal background, which might explain his bold attitude towards Chef Ramsay. You want to speak with me? Yeah, I want you to speak with you. fuck with me? I will fuck I with you. Fuck with you. Man, I will fuck I with you. Fuck. He didn't care about customer feedback, thinking they were out to get them. There's a lot of online bullies and haters and bloggers. And Sammy had a real problem with criticism. If the food was bad, it was always the customer's fault for not knowing good food. If anyone tell me that my wife's food is no good, I just tell them to leave the restaurant. I don't want them and don't come back. Ironically, the ones complaining about being attacked were the ones attacking their customers. Like that time, a cameraman had to step in to stop Sammy from getting physical with a customer. You! Call no. the police! Take I the money! No, I want the money from him! I am calling the police! You guys are fucking no, crazy! Just... Amy even threatened to call the cops on the police, but she wouldn't actually do it. She wasn't about to get into more trouble. Why? because Amy has a history with the law. Back in 2003, before she married Sammy, she spent time in federal prison for misusing a social security number to get a $15,000 loan. She had other legal issues too, with four judgments in Colorado from 1998 to 1999, and another in Arizona in 2000. During the argument with customers, the couple probably forgot about their own legal past. And when it finally hit Sammy, he did this. You guys are fucking No, he's just calling the police. I know, but hey, you're- Yup, he quickly cut off Amy because no one wants trouble with the cops when they have a history like theirs. I was there, I saw at least 50 people come and go. 50? They were in and out so yeah. fast. The place was beyond saving, and Chef Ramsay knew it was time to move on. Water. Jesus Christ, are you gonna attack me for wanting to fucking drink some water too? My God! Amy's baking company closed on September 1st, 2015, unable to survive. In a tweet about the closure, Amy's baking company said they could now focus on other projects, though what those might be remains unclear. Amy struggled with the massive attention they got after filming. Instead of focusing on the restaurant or the food, the spotlight was now on her. She even compared their situation to being a Disneyland for eccentric people. Speaking of which, have you seen this? Yeah, it was pretty wild. People started showing up outside their restaurant, snapping pics like they were at a circus. Here's what she had to say. Reporter Anna Garcia, who's with Sammy and Amy. Amy didn't hold back. She expressed her frustration with Chef Ramsay saying this. These people that hide behind the computer screen, the Camel Toe Mafia, they are pussies, they are pansies, they have no balls. Because I don't think Amy will ever get it. Totally agree with this viewer who says Amy isn't just a Karen, she's in a league of her own. And Sammy wasn't just watching Amy ramble, he went live threatening to sue Fox, Chef Ramsay, and the entire Kitchen Nightmares crew. Seriously? He couldn't even keep the cops away. If he'd run the restaurant properly, he might have avoided all this public mess. The drama and confrontations led to a lot of criticism and backlash. Then there's Sammy's wild claim that Chef Ramsay was exploiting Amy physically. Seriously? I didn't see Chef Ramsay get anywhere near her. Sammy, get real and come up with something believable. The show dismissed their accusations, saying, The owners of Amy's baking company continue to make baseless and inflammatory comments. These ridiculous accusations are completely untrue. While this restaurant remains one of my favorite confrontations, some folks think it was just a money laundering scheme. <laughs> the owners didn't care about the business, the customers, or the feedback. But here comes an owner with a legit criminal background. And when I say criminal, I mean the real deal. Mafia, underworld, kingpin, drug lord, you name it. Remember that self-proclaimed meat sculptor creator? Some people have called me a meat sculptor or a meat creator. Wow, this guy's off his rocker. Anyway, aside from running Burger Kitchen, Alan was the son of Abe Saffron. Yeah, the infamous mob boss. Abe was basically a celebrity criminal, always making headlines and not for anything good. He may have shown himself as an Aussie hotelier and real estate guy, but Abe was behind a ton of shady stuff, extortion, smuggling, gambling, and even murder. He had a reputation for being ruthless and managed to escape the law most of the time. The Saffrons had money coming out of their ears, but even after his death, Abe kept pulling strings from beyond the grave. His shadow still looms over Australian cities, and Alan was caught up in it all. Listen to what Alan had to say about his father. My father was brilliant at math and brilliant at business. Abe was on top of his empire, but he didn't play fair with his will. 
Alan got way less than his sister and Abe's mistress, who got a huge $25 million. So it's no wonder Alan had strong feelings about his father. That's about the best way I can describe it. Insatiable and had no moral compass whatsoever. But wait, it gets worse. The will had a nasty clause. If Alan challenged it, he'd be cut off entirely. And it's unfair because Alan had to deal with the fallout from his father's wrongdoings all through his childhood. Sharing his experience, Alan said, uh, You know, they, he was, his father was, you know, this Sodom and Gomorrah figure who was... Not surprising where the hate towards his father comes from, right? Abe's criminal empire spanned over three decades, from the 1940s to the 1970s. He ran the notorious King's Cross and was known as Mr. Sin. His list of crimes was endless. Arson, insurance fraud, bribery, blackmail, you name it. He built his fortune on these shady deals, but his family ties were all about treachery and deceit. She tried to commit suicide three times. In November 1948, Abe married Doreen Krantz, a hairdresser, and Alan was born soon after. So, Alan's son Daniel, who was supposed to get the inheritance, got robbed by Alan himself. You know, but, um... It's wild that Alan, who always called out others for foul play, ended up doing the same thing to his own son. Sure, Alan had a rough childhood, but taking out his issues on Daniel wasn't right. Even if he tried to justify it, it just didn't make sense. I get that Alan didn't get much from Abe's will, but that doesn't mean he had the right to take Daniel's share. Sure, the inheritance came from dirty money, but it was still Daniel's. Things could have been better if Alan had involved Daniel in managing the business, especially since it was Alan's money. At least there'd be fewer hard feelings. Instead, Alan made all the decisions without even discussing them with Daniel. He changes the menu way too often, and he doesn't tell anyone. He didn't just keep decisions from Daniel, he also kept the restaurant's finances a secret. No wonder Daniel felt betrayed. And to top it off, here comes a bigger issue, right from the horse's mouth, might I add. I did not picture myself doing this, but these are the cards I've been dealt, and I want to make it a... Yeah, it's rough. Daniel was stuck with this restaurant thing because it was Alan's dream, not his own. With a million bucks, Daniel could have pursued so many other opportunities. Alan basically used his son to fulfill his own unfulfilled dreams. It's a real shame when a parent's selfishness messes with their kid's future. Daniel really got the short end of the stick here. The kind of behavior Alan had around Daniel was simply wrong and damaging to boot. This kind of environment can really damage a parent-child relationship, turning what should be nurturing into something harmful. A parent should support their child's growth and happiness, not use them for their own gain. It makes sense why Daniel felt so bitter and betrayed. He was basically just a pawn in his dad's quest for personal satisfaction. My son has a great deal of resentment towards me, and I don't know why. I get it. Alan's tough childhood with his criminal dad clearly left its mark. Research shows that kids with criminal fathers often face a bunch of serious issues. Even though Alan faced his own struggles, he had a chance to change things for Daniel and give him a better life. But, as Gordon noticed, Alan ended up just like his father, Abe. In his book, Gentle Satan, Alan aired his grievances about his dad, and Gordon noticed how similar those complaints were to what Daniel was saying about him now. He hated being called out on his behavior, especially by his son. The betrayal from his dad and the way his mom treated his girlfriend drove Daniel into a really dark place. Watching him break down was genuinely heartbreaking, and it always gets to me, no matter how many times I see it. Keep killing me, you know? You really are. You really, really are. Here's a twist. Despite the Saffron family's immense wealth, Abe didn't flaunt it much early on. He only started driving fancy cars, like the two Rolls Royces later in life. His Vaucluse bungalow was pretty modest until Alan got married. Doreen, Abe's wife, and Alan's mom wanted them nearby, so they ended up expanding the bungalow. If Alan had handled things better, the burger kitchen might not have fallen apart, and Daniel might have had fewer complaints. Under Alan's poor leadership, the restaurant went through several menu and staff changes. By August 2011, ownership shifted, and by October, they rebranded and downsized the menu with a new team. However, negative Yelp reviews continued, and the restaurant eventually closed in 2012. Today, the spot is home to a Greek restaurant and cocktail bar called Theia. Sadly, Alan Saffron passed away from a heart attack in April 2020 at age 71. Have you ever thought about giving him anything for the money? I even found his obituary while researching for this video. Alan is survived by his wife Jen, daughter Rebecca, sons Daniel and David, grandson Bodie, daughter-in-law Wendy, and granddaughter Millie. His obituary praised him as a fighter, noted he became a U.S. citizen in 2019, and transitioned to a talent manager after stepping away from the restaurant. He worked with big names like Tobin Bell and helped kick off the Saw franchise, earning the Talent Manager of the Year award and co-producing several films at Atlantic Studios. Despite being the son of a notorious mafia boss, Alan was also a patriot who served in the Australian Army. 
As for Daniel, he keeps a low profile online, but his girlfriend Wendy, whom his parents didn't like, has acted in four projects. Abby Singer, America Brown, Exist, and Black Christmas. Hey, maybe y'all should go check out these movies and see if you can recognize her. And by the way, it's a well-documented fact that Daniel's brother David is a pretty interesting character. On LinkedIn, he appears to be doing a ton of things, since he was listed as the CEO of A9 Models, which admittedly has a meager presence on Instagram with just one post and nine followers. But he's also listed as the marketing manager for WizKids Now. However, California business records revealed a rather startling revelation. He's also the registered owner of an S&M performance venue in Los Angeles known as Master D's Academy of Sin. Mr. Sin lives on, I guess. A visit to the venue's Facebook page revealed a ton of, well, stuff I can't really talk about here. But it was crazy, let me tell ya. On the other hand, David Saffron, who painted himself as a tech genius, boasted about handling 17,500 crypto transactions per hour and claimed to have developed big-name apps and security software. His fake persona let him live lavishly, throwing Hollywood parties funded by investors. But by March 2019, the money ran out, and he made wild excuses, from blockchain issues to solar flares, even sharing a video of himself tied up to claim he was held hostage. Investors got wary and confronted him, but Saffron responded with threats. Eventually, he faced serious charges, seven counts of wire fraud, commodity fraud, and obstruction of justice, risking up to 115 years in prison. Despite this, he's pleaded not guilty. Turning to Abe Saffron, his dark past is equally chilling. A secret police record from the 70s hints at a shady meeting between Saffron and high-ranking police officials, excluding Police Commissioner Merv Wood and Deputy Commissioner Bill Allen, who later fell from grace due to their connections with him. Saffron's influence was so vast that a retired officer thinks exposing the records could spark multiple royal commissions. Saffron ran a sprawling criminal empire for over 70 years, only serving 17 months for tax fraud. He wasn't directly involved in managing clubs and brothels by the 70s, but owned the real estate they operated on. His iron fist rule extended to personally collecting debts and rumored drug trafficking investments. Questions remain about his wealth. Despite a reported $25 million inheritance, doubts persist about hidden offshore funds. Allen and niece Buckingham, though suspicious, chose not to contest the will to avoid further family conflict. Amidst the family's criminal ties, hopefully, Daniel Saffron has managed to break away from the dark legacy, finding strength and resilience. But here comes an owner who recently ran into some legal trouble. In Season 2, Episode 8, Chef Ramsay met Sammy Sedembra, who'd been working since he was 8, but still ended up in a million dollars in debt. Guys, I was 8 years old when I started. I worked at my brother Benny's restaurant. Sammy owned Sabatiello's, an Italian restaurant in Stamford, Connecticut. Despite his years of experience making pizzas at his brother's pizzeria, Sammy's dream restaurant quickly tanked. And it slowly declined. And we need some customers. I know, I can't believe this. When the episode was filmed, Sabatiello's was bleeding thousands of dollars each month and was on the brink of closing. Sammy didn't see any issues with the restaurant, but staff members Lauren and David blamed him for its failure, citing his bad attitude, which drove away both staff and customers. The Nimer at Sabatiello's, it's Sammy. Despite his denial, Sammy knew he was in trouble, with $1 million in debt and his house on the line. I presently have over a million dollars in debt. Chef Ramsay saw through Sammy's warm facade. Oh my god, look at this. Isn't it inviting, nice and warm? It is nice and warm. When testing the food, he ordered homemade lasagna, wedding soup, and a medium rare New York strip steak. It's so a wedding soup. It consists of vegetables and little mini meatballs. It's really nice. He was shocked that the wedding soup came out in minutes and was disappointed by its taste. Yeah, that's a wedding soup? That's to get him in the mood to get married. Jesus, I'd rather get fucking divorced. He also doubted that the lasagna was truly homemade. If that is homemade, I'll fucking dance in this restaurant tonight, start bollock naked. The steak didn't impress Chef Ramsay either. It was tough, poorly seasoned, and greasy. The food is consistent, consistently poor. To confirm his suspicions, Ramsay talked to head chef Jose, who revealed that the lasagna was made last Friday and frozen, the soup was three days old, and the steak wasn't even Aberdeen Angus as claimed. How old was that soup? The soup has been like uh, three days with me, yeah. Three days with yeah. you. Yeah. Sammy's business was failing, but he used lame excuses. He finally started to see Sabatiello's flaws, but didn't realize he was the main issue. That's when Chef Ramsay confronted him directly. You're very pumped up. I have you ever thought? Because I believe we have good stuff. Yeah. Are you asking me or telling me? That's got to be one of the dumbest ways to shut someone down. And I can't believe you're telling me my food sucks. I can't believe it. 
At one point, Chef Ramsay found out they were using fake crab meat, and when he confronted Sammy, he acted like it was no big deal. Hey, you're making me look horrible in front of this guy. You're my number one guy, right? Ramsay decided the kitchen was the main issue and reopened Sabatiello's as an Italian steakhouse with a new menu. Awesome. Change it to an Italian steakhouse totally made a lot of sense because I have too much competition. On relaunch night, Chef Jose still couldn't do his job, causing delays and returns. You getting old? And Jose's not doing the work. We kept getting in the weeds. We kept getting behind. Sammy stepped up to help, and diners enjoyed the food and service. Let's do it. Let's do it. Put it, put it, put it. That's good. Bye-bye. A few months later, Sammy said he wouldn't return to the show, claiming he lost more money than he made and didn't get paid for lost income. He went back to blaming others. Sabat Yellows closed in October 2008 after the episode aired. Before shutting down, Sammy put up a sign saying, Gordon Ramsay's favorite Italian in Fairfield County. Two months later, Sammy opened Sabatiello Gourmet Pizza in Riverside, but it quickly closed because he couldn't pay rent. Things got worse when Sammy was arrested for vandalizing his own restaurant and using stolen credit cards. He turned himself in and was later released on a $20,000 bail. And that wraps up the most corrupt kitchen nightmares owner ever. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you thought this video was wild, drop a like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications. And hey, don't miss the next video drop right here. It's even crazier.